Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Ruby Rogues Podcast. This week on our panel, we have Dave Kimura. Hey, everyone. Andrew Mason. Hello. Nate Hopkins. Hello, everybody. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv, and this week we have a special guest. It's David Heinemeyer Hansen. Hey, everyone. Now, I think most people know who you are in the Ruby community, but do you want to just give a brief introduction anyway? Sure. I'm David Heinemeyer Hansen. I am the creator of Ruby on Rails and a co-founder and CTO at Basecamp. Nice. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give you full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. You mentioned before the start of the show that uh, you're just about ready to release Rails 6 Final. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and the process for getting from Rails 5 Final to Rails 6 Final? Sure. Yeah, it's pretty exciting that we're finally here. We originally had a roadmap that would have released the final version of Rails Conf, but I don't think we've actually ever stuck to a roadmap for a release in Rails history. So uh, why start now? Um, But... We're almost here, and it's pretty exciting. In some ways, it, it almost feels like catching up. I've been running Rails 6 for a very long time now. We're working on some new stuff at Basecamp. We're using it in a new project. We've used Rails Master for some time for Basecamp 3. So in some ways, it just feels like I finally get to share the version of Rails that I've been working on for quite a while, particularly the two brand new frameworks, Action Mailbox and Action Text are frameworks that I've been using in my new project. And I feel like, man, I hate to start a new project and not have access to those two things. It's actually kind of funny that it's taking us this long to build something for both of those things. Because every single application I have built since I started working with Ruby in 2003 have needed to process incoming email in a cohesive way and to deal with rich text in some shape or form. So to finally have frameworks that not only address those problems directly, but do them in the trademark Rails way of making it incredibly easy, compress the complexity that's involved with both of those two domains, and serve it up as though, hey, you just drop in another file, now you're processing and routing incoming emails, or you simply replace your form text area with a rich text area and boom, now you can process rich text with all the sorts of formatting you can get with file uploads, with previews working. These two frameworks are particularly action text actually, I think are some of the most magical frameworks we've ever had. And I say that with a beaming of pride. I understand that there's a lot of people in the programming community who view magic as something that's bad, which I think is just a terribly depressing stands to have that um, magic is something bad. Magic just means it's amazing technology that you don't understand how it works yet. Shouldn't that be an invitation to learn how it works or at least to marvel at the magic? I think so. And I think that that is one of those trademark Rails tent poles that are still weird and unique 15 years after the release of the framework that magic is a good thing. Magic, and we're doubling down on the integrated framework as well. Action text relies on all the other parts of the framework in a way that perhaps no other framework in Rails has done, that we're building on top of our own shoulders, that we are now relying on everything from Webpacker to active storage, a framework that was just introduced in the last release of Rails. We already now have a framework that builds on top of that. That's the magic and progress of conceptual compression. And to see us finally take advantage of that ourselves as framework builders is um, really satisfying. 
And, you know, one of the benefits of Action Text that I really highlight and that I love is a built-in security to it. Because if you've ever tried using a different kind of WYSIWYG editor like Summernode or any of the other ones out there, then you are almost immediately prone to a cross-site scripting issue. And Action Text just does such an amazing job of sanitizing the user input to where you don't even have to worry about it. And then with the Action Mailbox, I've tried rolling in my own incoming email service, and it was a mess. Those back in the Rails 3 day, but the code just got very complicated very quickly. And having seen what the Action Mailbox can do for us, it's just completely amazing. So I'm really excited about the Rails 6 release. Well, and, and on the point of the magic, for me, it's these are the mental shortcuts you can take. And then if you have to deal with it, then you can go understand it. Yes, that's really the premise of conceptual compression. It's not that no one ever needs to know how the things work. I think everyone should strive to understand as much as they can. But you can't understand everything on day one. And you don't have to understand how everything works to be able to use it. If we require everyone to understand everything about every aspect of web development, well, we're basically saying 10 years of experience required or you're not invited. That seems just like an affront to anyone who's trying to learn. I was just talking to someone yesterday who was asking me about learning web development. And I was thinking through, if you were to enumerate all the things that we rely on as web developers and you had to understand all of that in fundamental depth, you would be studying, yeah, 10 years before you'd be able to write something. That just, that's wrong, right? We have to have an on-ramp for not only junior developers, but developers coming from other domains and invite them into working on web applications, being able to do it safely such that, for example, security is something that most of the time you don't have to worry that hard about because we've already addressed all the major pitfalls in in really professional ways, because we've had someone who does know everything about security, review it or work on it, and that that benefit then falls to everyone in the community to to use. And then we can have experts, too, that kind of have uh, one area of expertise. They contribute that area of expertise, say security, and then maybe they're not the greatest JavaScript developers and and they then rely on someone else doing the JavaScript system. We can have uh, rich text editing. And together we come and share those improvements. And, uh, and no one actually necessarily has to understand all of Rails. I made this um, quip uh, a few years ago on Twitter, basically saying, like, I don't understand Rails. Like, If you are to describe that as, do I understand how everything in Rails is implemented? Absolutely not. I look up all the time what, uh, what something is when I stumble into it or, or want to use it. But I'm also completely confident in not understanding everything. And we need to get to that point that it's okay not to know everything. It's okay to rely on other experts in the community and trust that they've done a good job. And then if you want to, hey, do the deep dive. Over the years, you're going to end up doing those deep dives and you're going to end up knowing more and more. But uh, that ramp shouldn't be prohibitively steep. It should be shallow enough that it's inviting for everyone to jump on. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point because, I mean, look back at the Rails 2 and Rails 3 days. You didn't have a lot of things like active jobs. You didn't have active storage, action mailbox, you know, action text, and all these other components of the Rails framework, and now you do. So the learning curve is steeper today for the Rails 5, Rails 6 than it was back in the Rails 2 and 3 days. And by you guys making it... I'm, I'm just, I mean, I'll let you finish. I'm just going to flag that I, I strongly disagree with that statement. <laughs> I can come back well, to that writing on that. Simply what I mean is for a basic application, you didn't have as much that was just initially brought in. And by you guys adding in a lot of this, quote, magic that people are so angry about, what you're allowing is for a new developer to come in on a current modern Rails application and get up to speed a lot faster on a new application because they don't have to go through all the configuration. They don't have to go through all the learning of every individual component because it's been made so easy that a simple blog post or tutorial or even the Rails readmes can step them through that process. So it's not like a steep learning curve that you would have in the .NET world or something. 
I, I agree with, with that part to, to an extent. The only point I take um, some note with is this notion that earlier versions of Rails were easier to learn and use. Yes, there was less in the box, but if you needed to do the other things, you had to build those yourselves. And that is a much steeper learning curve than being able to rely on a framework. So, for example, if you were going to do inbound email processing and routing in the Rails two, three days, what did Rails offer you to do that? Well, basically nothing. Right? You had to build everything from scratch. If you wanted to do uh, background job processing, what did Rails give you to help with that? Almost nothing. You had to sort through a bunch of gems or you had to build something yourself or you had to integrate with external services yourself. And I think that that's what's often missing in the discussion about is a framework complicated? Is it large? Is it hard to learn? Is we view these things in isolation. Oh, these days Rails has, well, it's funny. I, I was going to throw up seven frameworks. I don't even know how many frameworks <laughs> Rails has at this point off the top of my head. It has a fair amount, but is it stuff that most people need to use most of the time to build web applications? I don't know. Yes. It doesn't mean that all this stuff is something that all applications need all of the time, but the things we put in are, are something that you'd have to do anyway. And if you have to deal with these problems anyway, aren't we better off that we include solutions to many of these problems in the box. Now, you can always have a discussion about where does the line go, and you could also say, well, we should have authentication in the box or user controls in the box. I have a, a taste and a, a line that I feel is appropriate for Rails, but at least if you just compare Rails to Rails, so Rails 6 compares, compared to Rails 2.3 or compared to Rails 3, I would argue Rails 6 is far, far easier to learn and understand and build real applications with than the earlier versions were. Yes, there's more stuff. No, you don't have to learn all the frameworks up front. But as soon as you hit the problems that those frameworks address, you're going to sigh a sigh of relief because you're going to go, oh, man, I'm so glad I don't have to dig through rich text processing frameworks, figuring out how to hook that in with my domain model, figuring out how to deal with uploads, there is just like a month of work that simply got flushed away, and now I'm left with, uh, with a single tag I can replace it with instead. That's just a monumental step forward in ease of use, ease of on-ramp. And that's the work that really keeps me excited and interested in doing Rails, that we're ending up with a framework now 15 years later, or I don't know, Rails 2.3 is from what? 2007 or 8 or something like that. 10 years later, we already had a good framework back then, but now we have a framework that's so much better in, in almost all the ways because it addresses more of the real problems that uh, most developers will face most of the time. It's almost the, uh, the standard library argument as opposed to having a, a package manager with, with a very lightweight or like no standard library, essentially something like Ruby compared to and the Ruby standard library compared to JavaScript and the NPM system. Completely. And I think that this is where Rails remains controversial because we are, well, at least I am, completely unashamed and completely embracing of integrated systems and integrated frameworks. As much as I respect the Unix philosophy of independent tools that just do one job and, and you mix together as you see fit, that is not the philosophy of Rails. Rails is not just a bunch of one-by-one -one Lego blocks that you can dump on the floor and then we say, hey, you figure it out. No, we do the hard work of saying, we're going to figure it out. We're going to build bigger blocks that you can put together quicker and get to the solutions that you're actually looking to do. And I think that that continues to just cut against the grain of how most developers intuitively view the world. Most developers have an intuitive affinity for small independent tools where they can carefully evaluate whether that block fits with that block and come up with these little bespoke solutions that make them feel unique and, um, and special. And Rails from the beginning has said, you know what, we're not that special. Basecamp is not that special. GitHub is not that special. Shopify is not that special. None of the million plus applications that have been made with Ruby and Rails, the majority of them share the majority of their concerns, that those are technical concerns and technical levels of complexity that we can abstract away. And yes, you lose a little bit of um, knobs and dials, perhaps more so in the abstract than in the concrete of how these things fit together. But what you get back is so overwhelmingly worth it. That is the large philosophical 
argument that we've been making for 15 years with, I think, varying degrees of success. When Rails was sort of the hot new thing, a lot of people were persuaded by these arguments. Now that Rails is simply the stable long running thing, I've seen a lot of regression on that question in the wider development community. And you see something like JavaScript, for example, and how they approach packaging go 180 degrees in the opposite direction, right? It's a trillion tiny packages that all fit together. And I'm not even going to render a verdict on what I think about that. People can probably infer that from (laughs) this rant, but it is certainly a different one, right? And we should, first of all, recognize those differences, respect those differences, but also embrace those differences. That what we're doing in the development community is not just trying to come up with the same answer over and over and over again in five different languages. No, we should have different answers to the same question, but looked at from a different perspective. And that's what makes the work interesting. And that's why it's good that we continue to have multiple different communities that are all sort of trying to do the same thing. How do we build web applications? Well, and we have so many different answers to that. And, and I think that's that's wonderful. Rails stands for a very strong answer. That is, integrated systems are good. Systems that are made to know of each other and built on top of each other is good. Monolithic applications built with integrated frameworks are good. And I think that that's uh, taking a stand for those values clearly describes how does Rails fit into the world today? Because I think it's always been kind of a cop-out for everyone to say, oh, it depends. You know what? No one ever learned anything from hearing it depends. I think it's the ultimate coward cop-out, actually, that you're afraid of stating, well, what does it depend on? And unless you can describe that in some clear terms that that have some trade-offs, at least just on the philosophical level, uh, like do you think integrated systems are good or do you want to have everything as an individual piece? You're not doing anyone any service. So I I think that's the other part of the whole Rails incredible journey is that I have from day one said, no, we will stand for something and we will be okay with the fact that some people are are not interested or not uh, appealed to by that stance. And that is a feature, not a bug. And we're not going to cop out and just say it depends. So one thing that I'm curious about is, you know, we've talked about all of these different pieces of the framework that come together to make Rails 6. How do you decide which of these problems you're going to tackle? And how do those come out of Basecamp? Do you actually extract code from Basecamp and turn them into that new library? Or is it kind of the other way around where it's, we need a solution to this problem, so we're going to go build it into Basecamp or build it into Rails and then put it in Basecamp? So I'd like to pick back on that question too, if, if, if you will humor me for a minute. And that is, what is it that drives Basecamp's um, methodology in terms of what tools you decide to build. So for example, active storage was a new solution that already had a lot of gems, kind of popular gems that were being pulled into Rails. Is it, and and I know there's a sense in the community that there's some not invented here type mentality that's going on. I'm just wondering what the thought process is, what what happens at Basecamp to, to decide to rework something that already has a solution? Yep, both great questions. I, I, let me start with the first, which is, our, do we invent frameworks and then use them in Basecamp when we see a need, or do we extract code from Basecamp? It is absolutely the latter. We extract code from Basecamp. So both action text and action mailbox are large parts code that's lifted straight out of the Basecamp lip directory, where we already had these proto-frameworks living. They were just unextracted. And sometimes, well, most of the times, when the frameworks live inside of, uh, of an application, they're application-specific in some terms. We take some shortcuts or we hard-code things and so forth. So the process of extraction is to liberate the framework ideas from the application ideas and to separate the two things such that there's not really a base camp mark on the framework that comes out beyond the shaping, the philosophical underpinnings of how we see the world and the sort of uh, affection for a certain API or, or something else like that. But when you see like an action text framework, like there's nothing particularly base camp about it. That's exactly actually when usually I decide that we should extract the framework from base camp is when I realize 
But this is not Facebook camp specific. If I were to build another application and I'm, I'm working on some new stuff at Basecamp now that is a new code base, I want those things. And the rule I always, or the constraint I always set on myself is I will not copy code from one application to another. If I am copying code from one application to another, I am missing a framework liberation step. And I'd much rather liberate a framework than copy code between code bases. So that's actually how we ended up with Action Text and Action Mailbox. We had those things for years in Basecamp, just in unliberated form. And I wanted to use both of those things again in a new project. That's often how it goes. That's often when there's a big push for me to revisit what Rails should have or, or new frameworks that could go in. Then I start working on something new, and then I realize, hey, I'd already built a bunch of this stuff. I want to reuse it. I've set myself the constraint that I can't copy code. I have to release code to use it. So I do that. As far as the, the um, not invented here thing goes, it's one of those things. I mean, I am perhaps to a fault attracted to sayings that most people would have a negative reaction to. And, and I find ways of embracing those as positive things. Absolutely, I suffer personally from a not invented here syndrome in the sense that when I go to look at something like uh, how do we store files with an application? I go back to first principles every single time. My natural instinct is not, oh, did someone already write this code and can I just kind of amend my sensibilities to how that's written and then use it? No, it is, let me analyze the problem from first principles, from the perfect view of how I think the integration between, say, file storage and a Rails application should be. Once I've done that analysis, I'll look to see if there's something that lines up with that. There often is, and we certainly don't uh, and everything from scratch. Rails uses all sorts of frameworks and have pulled all sorts of good ideas in over time when there was great overlap. When it came to um, active storage, which I think is a great case to use, absolutely, there were a bunch of good gems in the community already, and they were built for a time that were not relevant for us anymore. At Basecamp, we've moved all our file storage to the cloud. And it's my assessment, both on the base camp level, but also on the industry level, that if you are storing uh, terabytes of files yourself, you're probably doing it wrong. I mean, it's not that there's never a case for it. Like if you're Dropbox and, and a very large share of your costs are wound up in storing petabytes or I don't know what comes after petabytes, more than petabytes on someone else's cloud, perhaps you have a justification for building out your own cloud storage system. Well, I've, we've been running at Basecamp for over 10 years, a variety of in-house file storaging systems, all these enterprise systems like Isilon. And that's the last one I remember. I've blissfully forgotten the rest because they all fucking suck. And we've now migrated all our stuff, all our file storage to the cloud and life is better. Ergo, I have drawn the conclusion that life is going to be better for me, in all the applications that I can imagine building that require file storage, if I store those files in the cloud, I'm not going to go back to building my own storage solutions on-prem. Ergo, whatever framework I use to store my files should be treating uh, cloud file storage as the predominant default case. And when I reviewed the existing solutions that were out there, none of them were built cloud files first. They were all built local storage first, cloud files sort of attached. And then, of course, the other thing too is a reason, that's, I mean, perhaps the most defensible reason you could say. A more egocentric answer is that I have very particular opinions about how frameworks should be designed, how APIs should be designed. And perhaps not surprisingly, when I haven't decided or designed an API, I'm likely to fault find fault when it's implementation for my sensibilities, not fault as in like, this isn't a good thing that people could use or it isn't functional or it isn't all these things. But when I write applications, I take every single file, every single controller, every single model, every single helper, and I go over it over and over and over again with a fine comb to find how can I improve the APIs? How can I make this read better? How can I make it more fluid, more intuitive, cut out more incidental complexity, boil it down, compress the 
accidental complexity into something that I don't even need to be able to remember two years from now. And yeah, I mean, it's not surprising that as I go through that process, if I'm, I'm using external tools to a large degree, I'm, I'm going to fall, find fault with those sensibilities because those sensibilities weren't mine. And again, I completely accept and embrace that that sounds egocentric. That sounds perhaps even narcissistic. And yes, that is one of the faults that um, I choose to bear. And it means that sometimes we, oftentimes, we go the long route. We build an incredible amount of framework code at Basecamp, a disproportionate amount. I'd say if you were to take the ratio of lines of code written in the history of Basecamp's, well, history, and you compare how much of that is application code versus how much of that turned into framework code, I think we have a completely out of whack compared to industry norms standard. But you know what? I don't have any regrets of that. Yes, it means that sometimes it takes us longer to go a certain way, but we end up in a place where I really like working. And one of the other benefits of having worked for this long in a successful software company and being an owner of it is I don't have to work. So the only reason I choose to work is because I choose to work. And for me to choose to work, it has to be interesting. And I have to be engaged with the work itself. It's not just about can we get the thing done. It's just as much for me now as it was, I mean, 15 years ago, is do I enjoy the journey getting there? And I'm flawed in the way that for me to enjoy the journey, the code has to be close to perfect. And the only way I know how to do that is to assist in the design of it. Again, I'm putting things on a point here to make a point. It doesn't mean that we don't use other gems. It doesn't mean that we don't use other pieces of technology. It doesn't mean that every single damn API that I ever touch is something I have a have to have a hand designing. It just means I enjoy my work more when I do. Yeah, and you know, to a lot of those points, what I found, I just went back and looked at an old application and then a new application that I'm about to ship in Rails 6. The old application was written originally in Rails 4 and the number of gem dependencies that it had, it's over 50 and it's insane. The new application with almost the same level of complexity, I'm using... 10 gems outside of what's included in Rails. So not only is this new application going to be easier to maintain in the long run, but Rails 6 has just packed in so much stuff to help us out that deviating from the Rails core, the Rails way of doing things is almost a anti-pattern today because maintaining this older application written in Rails 4, it's going to be a real pain to update it to Rails 5 because I have to make sure that all of these gems are compatible. I have to make sure that all the tests are still running well. But I have a feeling that when Rails 7, 8, whatever comes along, this new application is going to be very simple to maintain and upgrade because I've stuck so close to the Rails core. I'm not using anything like React or Vue or Angular. The only thing I've really added in was Stimulus, that between the power of Turbolinks and Rails JS, I really had no need for any kind of front-end framework to complicate my infrastructure or the application. I think that's, uh, that's, that's the dream testimonial, right? I think, and it really goes to the point, which I was trying to get at before, but, but perhaps didn't hit squarely on the nail, which is Rails embraces integration work as part of the domain. When you go with the small independent blocks philosophy, the integration stuff, that's your problem. Finding ways to glue all this stuff together, keeping it in sync, keeping it up to date, your problem. Rails says, no, the integration work in many ways is the majority slice of the work. We should be doing more to lower that burden. That less time should be spent by application developers figuring out how things fit and work together. Again, there's a trade-off, and you trade off some degree of choice and so forth, but the rest premise is that that trade-off is, is overwhelmingly worth it, that if you can outsource to a framework, to Rails, an integrated framework, that integration, that fitting everything together and, and making sure that it continues to work together, oh, man, it's a huge burden off your, off your shoulders. And I think that that is the continued progress of the Rails framework and, and why I continue to be excited about working on it is exactly as we march forward that we eat more and more of this incidental integration complexity that most developers need to face most of the time when they're dealing with 
the same common issues as we're all dealing with. Now, as it comes to, um, it's funny you bring up the, the client side, because I think that that's one of the last frontiers. It used to not be an active frontier, but the last, what, five plus years, it's been almost the only frontier. And talk about a mess. Talk about an integration mess. Talk about an area that's ripe for something else. And that has actually been where a lot of our focus at Basecamp has been for the last uh, several years, is to write that story in a compelling way for us. And we've been writing that story since Turplinks was released. I don't know how long that was, three, four, five years ago? Lose track of that. But we've continued to build on it. So Turbolinks 5 was a massive upgrade that uh, enabled us to use um, Turbolinks inside of native applications. At Basecamp, we developed native applications in the native environments for both iOS and Android, but we rely heavily on web views to power those applications. And they're these hybrid things, and the hybridization is all powered by Turbolinks. But we've continued to work in that realm ever since. Stimulus is a great example. Great example, by the way, both of us continue to, to do our own thing on the client side. I mean, it is the opposite of what everyone else in the industry is doing. We're doubling down on the idea that HTML is a primary source. It's not just a sort of runtime compile output that creating HTML on the server side affords you a luxury of, of reach in terms of platform, of ease of reach, of ease of construction of applications, and of joy of making applications. And we have a whole bag full of unreleased additions to that that I'm super excited to work on for the next uh, year or so. And uh, there's a whole, it, it's kind of like, uh, it's funny, I'm not that actually big a fan of Elon Musk, but when he was talking about his master plan for like the Model 3 and the Model X and the Model S, and like, oh, I had that plan five years ago. It, that's where it feels a little bit like uh, with the base camp approach to front end development. I feel like we've had a master plan for at least a couple of years. We're still building the master plan, and I'm just um, excited to see it all come together. Excited mostly really for myself <laughs> in some regards. It's been interesting to see that Turbolinks and our approach to the front end has certainly not been a mainstream success in the way that, say, Rails was a mainstream success, that the predominant paradigm for front-end development is these React-inspired frameworks where HTML is generated from JSON and, and you build models on the, on the client side and you do re-rendering on the client side and so forth. And we're going in the opposite direction. And if someone decides to follow us on that direction, that's great. So that's why I said it, it sounded like the, uh, the perfect testimonial for that. But I also understand that like most people aren't. And that's okay too. We don't build open source software at Basecamp for like, for likes or for thumbs up or for stars. We build it because we need it. And then we just go like, it would be an other waste if we were not to share those things. So if other people adopt it, that's great. If other people don't adopt it, that's also great. You gave us a teaser a little bit about some stuff on the horizon, possibly with your front end approach. Sounds like enhancements to Turbolinks and stimulus and things like that. Can you give us any details? I'd say it's mostly about fleshing out the answer that Turbolinks and Stimulus are already providing pieces of the puzzle for, that we have a, a complete answer to how we want to build things on the front end at Basecamp, and we're still plugging those things together. And, and that answer has become more and more intertwined with what's required to build good native applications. We have phenomenal native applications for Basecamp and for, for things that we're working on at Basecamp built by tiny, tiny teams. When you talk to most software providers our size and, and you ask them, like, how big is your iOS team? It's usually pretty big, right? Like, if you build everything in native, it's not a super productive platform in the sense that, like, uh, HTML or, or web-based stuff is productive. It just takes longer to build stuff because it has a higher bar for fidelity and, and so on and so forth. Well, at Basecamp, we've decided... We don't want to be a large company. So that's also something that's driving our technology choices, that we need to be able to provide Basecamp on all platforms in a great form that customers love. And we want to keep doing that with a small team. How do you do that? Well, there are whole slices of approaches, uh, whole paradigms that are just inaccessible. Basecamp has, I think, 150 screens. If we were to build a native app for Basecamp that natively implemented 150 different screens and tried to keep that in sync with the rest of the code base, 
we'd need to double the size of our company. We're not interested in doing that. So <laughs> it's funny. It's the same fire that Rails was forged in, where Rails was forged in the fire that I'm one person working part-time, and I have to build a whole web application myself. Hmm, what tools do I need to do that? Oh, okay, I don't like the tools that are already there. It doesn't feel like I'm going to get from A to B. Let me build my own tools to get there. And that's where we are with a lot of this front-end stuff that reviewing the mainstream industry approaches, we just go like, they're incompatible with our organizational structure. They're incompatible with our goals for where the company should go. We kind of need to build our own stuff if we want to get to where we want to go. And also, we just enjoy building our own stuff. And we have sensibilities that are different from the mainstream. In terms of the specifics of like what's missing, I'm not going to sort of lay out the whole master plan. I think I'd like to have more of the pieces in, in actual place and then present them as they come in. But turbulence and stimulus already point the way, which is a view of the front-end world that is centered around HTML and, again, unashamedly embraces JavaScript as sprinkles. Again, I love sprinkles because it's such a polarizing word. Some people use scorn at sprinkles in the same way that some people scorn at monkey patches. And, and I love both sprinkles and monkey patches. So, But that's sort of the philosophy that HTML is at the center, not JavaScript. That doesn't mean we don't write JavaScript or we don't appreciate JavaScript or I'm not a big fan of all the progress that's happened in the JavaScript world. I am. Like, I think JavaScript has turned into an actually enjoyable platform, which was not true when I started working with JavaScript in the early 2000s. It was not exactly enjoyable. Now it has become enjoyable in many ways, not nearly as enjoyable for Ru as Ruby for me. I mean, I, I'd write Ruby any day, but um, at least now when I have to write JavaScript, I'm not like, oh, crap, JavaScript again, right? JavaScript is great, but that doesn't mean that, um, that everything should run through JavaScript or that I want to implement essentially my application as a distributed system where you have a client talking to a server in the sort of uh, most walled off sense of that word, where everything's just passing back and forth as a data layer. I think that's annoying as hell. I love ERB because it allows us to write client-side presentations that rely on a domain model and you can interact with the domain model directly and you don't have to translate the domain models across a JSON lossy compression layer and then recreate it on the other side. I'm not a big fan of, uh, of two-sided MVC. So we you know, talked to you long enough for Rails 6 to have come out? Actually, good question. Let me see if uh, Raphael has, uh, has pushed it. Well, he yeah. has not. He has not. I've, I've completed the announcement of the write-up, so I think he just uh, needs to push the button to release the gems and merge the announcement to the blog, and we're good to go. But um, I'm actually going to ping him right now again here in, uh, in Basecamp and, uh, and see what's up. One of the things that I find that we talk a lot about at the different conferences and the different things that I'm working on is open-source software. And a lot of people have a lot of ideas around open-source software, but we don't often think about the people who are building it and trying to maintain it. And I had a friend, John, who came to me. He's been a guest on JavaScript Jabber a couple of times. He came and he actually said, hey, Chuck, I wish there was a show about sustaining open source. And that really hit me where I live. And I have a few other friends who are working on projects related to this. So we all got together and we put together a show called Sustain Our Software. You can find it at sustainoursoftwarepodcast.com. And it's a place where several people who are passionate about open source come together and have conversations about how it can be sustained and how it can be maintained and what we can do to help these maintainers continue to deliver us value that we build our software on. Most of the software we're building is based on open source. And so it's important to us to have that maintained and have it taken care of. Come check it out. It's been really interesting to listen to the conversations that they're having from people who are working in it all the time and just hear what they have to say about it. Once again, that's at sustainoursoftwarepodcast.com. One other thing that I was curious about back on the conversation of extracting the libraries from Basecamp is once you have the library written, do you just go back into the Basecamp repo and essentially remove the code from there and then just include the gem? That's the optimal path, and that is the path we've taken tons of times. That's the path we took with Active Storage. Active Storage is fully reintegrated. We had all of Active Storage essentially inside of Basecamp already. We ripped it out, turned it into a framework, and put it back in. For some of these other frameworks we've done just very recently, we haven't done the reintegration yet, but um, that's definitely on the menu. Because it's just a lot more fun when you're working with the framework, because then you get to make changes 
that you need for your application directly to the framework, which gets to benefit everyone. So that's one of the reasons we try hard to run on Rails Master the majority of the time. And it's been perhaps one of the biggest steps forward in the larger Rails community in many years that we've gotten GitHub and Shopify to do the same. That these massive Rails applications are now running on essentially Rails Master. And both companies have developers who are on the Rails core team and who work to basically say when GitHub or Shopify does something with Rails, they can reintegrate it with Rails much quicker than the dark old days where, let's say, GitHub was on <laughs> Rails 2.3, while uh, the state of the art was Rails 4 or Rails 5. Thankfully, those are long gone. And I think another point that a lot of people don't realize is bringing on new team members onto your team. If you've deviated so far from the Rails way of doing things and the Rails core, then it's going to be exponentially harder to bring someone on and get them well-versed in your domain to start really being useful. Whereas if you stick to these standard kind of CRUD applications, and if you stick to the Rails way of doing things, then they're going to be able to come in, learn the domain knowledge so much faster. They're not going to be hiccuped by a lot of the decisions that were made early on, like we have to do React because that's the coolest thing today. So I think bringing on new people is just as important as maintaining that application long term And the more deviation you see, the harder it's going to be to bring on new people. I think that is exactly the argument for why GitHub and Shopify eventually ended up going. Actually, it makes a lot of business sense to be on the latest version of Rails to help put everything forward. Because these are probably two of the most ferocious hirers of programmers in the Rails community. I think, uh, I don't know how many of them are Rails programmers at Shopify, but Shopify is an organization. Last I talked to Toby about it was over 5,000 people. So the more frequently you need to onboard new developers, the more you'll go like, yeah, can we make that a little smoother? And obviously, if you're not running this bespoke individualized version of Rails that's stuck on a past version, that becomes a whole lot easier. So I think uh, it was partly just what's good for the community, partly driven by some great people inside of both of those companies, but also partly just driven by the business economics that if you can just hire a Rails developer and they can be productive, pretty quickly because your Rails application is just a basic Rails application. I mean, quote unquote, basic, but you're winning rather than if they have to essentially learn your homegrown fork of what the system that everyone else is using, that's not that great. And I think to the point of that too, it's really been um, satisfying to see both organizations, Shopify and GitHub come to the realization that even at their scale, right? Like Shopify is a $40 billion operation at this point. Even at that scale, to a large extent, there can still be a quote-unquote basic Rails application. Like, is there a more definitive argument in, in some regards that we're not all beautiful, unique snowflakes? Like, if there ever was a snowflake in the Rails community, surely that snowflake is Shopify. And yet, they've come to the realization that whatever parts of the business that's snowflakey, it not a lot of it means that we have to deviate that much from the Rails standard pack. Yeah, because I've worked on applications that took microservices to the next level. And to me, coming onboarding onto that application, it's almost unmaintainable. Just one bad decision on top of another bad decision, and then in a nightmare of an infrastructure. You know, it's almost impossible to be any sort of productive in it. Whereas if it were just a standard Rails monolith, I would be in there coding left and right. But unfortunately, a lot of infrastructure and technology decisions deviating from the Rails way of doing stuff just made it very difficult to work on. This is exactly why I've been such a big opponent of microservices for most people most of the time. It's because it goes exactly to the same philosophical fault line as we talked about earlier. Who does the integration work? Who understands the whole thing? Yes, of course you can carve out a small part of the application, turn that into a mini application, and then understanding that mini applications is easier than understanding the whole big application. But someone has to understand the whole big application. And if that someone is you, you've now sliced up your application into these independent subsets where now you have to understand the interactions between them and it's much harder. So for me, microservices and services in general, it's a fine pattern, 
for very large organizations that incorporate microservices as a way to split teams up. It makes no sense in almost all cases for small to medium-sized companies. And that's why I've been such a big proponent of the majestic monolith is because that pattern absolutely does make sense. Because again, the integration work is often half the work or more. If you have an application that's sliced up into 12 or 15 little mini microservices and uh, you're trying to make those things work together and you're trying to move forward, that is not easy. Yes, doing work on one of the 15 pieces is easy. Moving the whole thing forward, a lot less so. Well, not only that, but then you have people who started out on the microservices path with good intentions of, you know, let's make this application very isolated and independent. But then they've tightly coupled them so much that now you just have a monolith of microservices that are dependent on each other, not reusable anywhere else. And now you have 15 different applications that need to be upgraded on their own schedule. I've heard of of some cases where people go like, oh, we're really going to optimize all these things. So you have like 15 applications written in 15 different frameworks with 15 different languages. Yeah, good luck with that. Good luck with trying to keep that in sync and understandable and trying to onboard anyone else. Again, if you have a large company and each of those 15 applications makes sense as an independent team, the pattern works. The pattern makes sense. And I I would even go as far as to say I support the pattern. I've never worked in an organization like that, but I can see all the pressures and they make sense to me. It makes no sense to me when those pressures are not aligned. And I think that that is one of the core dangers we have in the technology industry, that the patterns of the sort of uh, web scale companies, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Twitters, whatever, they roam very, very loud. And they influence the technology choices of the rest of the industry, and often completely inappropriately so, that the vast majority of people making applications should not be inspired by how Google or Facebook or Amazon structure their internal teams. If you're drawing your organizational or technical inspiration from companies that have 10,000 times the number of employees that you do, you're doing it wrong. I've got a question. I know we're kind of winding down on our on our time here, but I do have a, a question in terms of you mentioned that Shopify is now running essentially Rails 6, GitHub is as well. How much are those larger companies driving you know, the, the feature extraction that you, you alluded to earlier with Basecamp? How much contribution are we seeing from those groups you know, proposing what new features of Rails might be coming on? Quite a lot. And that's been really exciting is that it felt for a while as though the big uses of Rails weren't necessarily contributing that much of, especially their feature work back to uh, Basecamp. And now that's totally changing. I think Rails 6 launches, for example, with uh, a huge upgrade in how you talk to multiple databases at the same time. That's all extracted from GitHub. It's all work that uh, Eileen and Aaron has been, uh, and people work on their teams, have been um, extracting from GitHub. And GitHub had all this machinery for a long time. They just had it in their bespoke fork of, of Rails. And now they're taking all that code and they're putting it into uh, into Rails itself. So that's been really awesome to see that feature development is not just driven by, say, uh, what we do at Basecamp. I mean, we continue to drive the feature development that we can extract, but that other and especially GitHub and Shopify, they're now starting to do the same. Because what both of those organizations and other large users of Basecamp had always sort of done was they were great about sort of fixing bugs, staying on top of security. Aaron, obviously, for many, many years have been focused on performance and making Rails faster. And, and all those benefits were always there and they were always coming into the framework. But the kind of marquee features, the things that go in the headline on a new release often weren't coming from those camps. So to see that it now is and and to talk to both of the teams about the backlog of things that they have to extract and put into Rails is uh, it's just awesome. And not to mention, Joel from GitHub is brought in Action View components you know, for Rails 6.1. You know, I've been playing around with that a bit, and I think that's going to really help out with reusing and performance. Yeah, I'm really happy that we made it very easy to add components-based framework into the views. How far we end up going with it, whether there's actually something that gets included that's called uh, 
components in Action View itself and does more than simply allow you to to render an object that fits a certain uh, method signature, I'm not so sure about. Because actually, from my end, I'm not convinced that uh, components is a direction that most applications should follow most of the time. But I'm totally on board with making it super easy to choose that path if you want to. And I think that that's also one of the ways that Rails have gotten a lot better over the years is, yes, there's a default path, but we continue to make it ever easier to swap out some of the default components or add in components if you go like, yeah, do you know what? Like, I like the default path, but just on this, this, and this question, I want something else. ERB, for example, great example. It was probably one of the earliest examples we did. I'm a big fan of ERB. I've been using ERB since the beginning, but there's a lot of other ways to render um, sort of the views. So if you like Hamel, Hamel is a really easy thing to drop in, and you almost feel like there's no difference. And it's almost like Rails shift with Hamel once you put in a template processor for that. The same thing with things like JBuilder that has perhaps like a, a one and a half party relationship. It's complete or included in the uh, shipping gem file, but it's still a separate thing. But it feels like it's part of Rails. And it's funny because obviously I use Rails in its most stock form, right? Because Rails, in many ways, is an extraction of the work I'd already been doing. So it'd be very odd if I wasn't using Rails in the stock form. But Ruby, I don't use Ruby in the stock form. I use Ruby in a heavily dialected form called active support. And that dialect is so appealing to me because it does not discriminate. When I use the active support aspects or dialect features that we put into Ruby, you can't tell the difference. What's native Ruby? What's active support added Ruby? You can't tell. That is an aspiration for me in terms of designing the framework that if you want to use our spec, it should drop in as though you barely can tell. If you want to use Hamel, it should drop in as though you barely can tell. I think the same is true with this component direction. If you want to use components for your, your views, it should drop in as though you could barely tell. Does that mean it should be part of the default approach and we should recommend it to everyone? I'm a lot less sure about that. I love that as a goal to kind of mirror the values that Ruby as a language has. I think it's fair to say that I've, uh, I've come to appreciate that this is one of the key reasons that I like Ruby. So even if my natural instinct is not to do this in Rails, I look at Ruby as a role model in that case and go like, okay, my natural intuition on this, which is just like, oh, let's just do ERB and everyone should use ERB. I counter that with my appreciation for what Ruby allows me to do as a dialect filter. I should extend the same courtesy to everyone else. One question you alluded to a new project you guys are working on at Basecamp. I've heard Jason talk about this a little bit. It almost sounded like it might be a business intelligence tool or something like that. I'm I'm kind of curious to learn a little bit more about what's on the horizon. Yeah, and I can't wait to share when we're ready to share. (laughs) Yeah, I've been working for this for a while. It's been driving a bunch of the work I've been doing in, in Rails, as it always does when I work on something new. We're not quite ready to uh, lift the veil for what it is, but um, we're getting closer and I'm excited about it. It's one of those other applications, just like the framework where I'm like, I want this. I've been missing this. And for a while, we sort of shrank our footprint with uh, with Basecamp. And we used to have a bunch of applications. We were running concurrently Backpack and Campfire and High Rise. And those things still run and we will continue to service them until the end of the internet. We just are not signing up new customers for those uh, products. So, now we're, we're finally, again, working on a major new application, a major new product. Who knows how it'll go? But uh, I'm excited to use it. I'm excited to share it. And I'm excited to extract the work that we've done within it. There's a bunch of key ideas that enable both the work on Basecamp 3 and now the work on this new product that I still haven't extracted and I kind of feel bad about because I wouldn't start a new product today without using those ideas. So, but that's how it always is. It's it's been like that for 15 years. There's always a lag. And I think that lag is actually helpful. All the times I've ended up regretting things I put in Rails was usually because I put them in too quickly because I didn't try them out for long enough in a real application because a real application always tells the truth. It's so easy for framework builders to bullshit themselves into thinking that they have a great idea and they'll work up some demo code or some example code and like, oh, doesn't this look great? And then as soon as you try to do something real with it, the idea just falls apart. So I've learned that lesson painfully a couple of times over the years. And 
Now I uh, accept that patience is a virtue when it comes to extraction and you should really use it in anger properly, preferably in production before you foist it on everyone else. I'm just going to tell myself that you guys are genetically engineering unicorns. <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny because um, unicorns, I think, I'm really sad that the word unicorn got captured by growth Uber Alice startups because unicorns are magical, right? Like unicorns yep. should be something we should all embrace. And I've come to the realization that the majority of tech startups that make it to unicorn status are trash in some aspect of that word, either trash culturally, trash economically, or trash societally. Not all of them. And that is a blanket statement of epic proportions. But I've been thoroughly disappointed with the impact that so-called unicorns has had on our industry and society for quite a few years now. So it is with some sadness that that word kind of got snatched and now we can't use unicorns to describe something lovely whenever i think of the word unicorn now it's not like my little pony unicorns it's like this evil red-eyed beast that's like half uh decaying and uh breathing fire and and that's not a positive image but i think that's probably another podcast (laughs) yep yeah it does remind me a little bit of you uh i remember you guys did a press release a while back it was a fake press release where you basically said that you're you know, somebody had invested a dollar for point oh 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 one percent or something of your company. And, you know, anyway, it was it was really funny. But yeah, you know, those kinds of thoughts, too, where it's it's not just a philosophy on, you know, how do we make a framework that solves these problems for people, but also, you know, focusing on real world results in business and things like that. You know, it, it's a lot of stuff that I have been inspired by over the years. And it's like, yeah, you know, what what's actually the outcome of what I'm getting here? And, you know, whether it's Rails and I put this framework into my application and it makes it easier or better to build, or whether it's what results am I getting from the business that I'm running and, you know, what things should I be caring about that actually make a difference instead of some pie in the sky idea. Yeah, I, I think I think they're conversations that not many people want to have because it's comfortable to sit back and invest in Facebook or Twitter or whatever. But I think it's highly profitable for society to really look at the outcomes that we're getting and recognize the value in the things that we're doing. And I think that that really describes well why so many technical choices at Basecamp are made from this first principles approach is we try to look at the whole thing as a, I'm not a big fan of this word at all because it sounds like fucking synergy, holistic approach to technology. The technology is not just about the technology. It's also about what it enables and what it encourages and, and, and so forth. And our encouragement and our part motivation for sharing tools like uh, Ruby and Rails and all this other stuff that we've been sharing, whether it's stimulus or turbulence and so on, is, as I said in a, in a past uh, RailsConf keynote, is to arm the rebels. I would love to see technology used for more good. And right now, technology deservedly has a bit of a tattered reputation because it's been used for a lot of shitty things. And I think uh, that's a damn shame because I'm also unashamedly a technologist. I think technology, I believe technology can be used for good, even though that optimism is looking a little blue eyed right now. I think we can get back to that. And I think that there are ways that we can, we can fight back and we can reset. And I've been incredibly encouraged by the, tech lash, if you want to call it that, the backlash against big tech that's been slowly growing over the years. I feel like we've been on the drums about the dangers of venture capitalist economics and the incentives that it places on businesses. And now it's finally hitting a high note and becoming a full-on political issues that major presidential candidates are taking up as a, as a tentpole plank. And wonderful. We want to serve that fight from the technology side, continue to enable small, independent software makers to be able to challenge these big, unhealthy, monopolistic behemoths of the industry. So to be building slingshots, to be building pebble stones, that's a very satisfying, quote unquote, business to be in, even though it's not a business at all. I talked about that at the RailsConf keynote this year, which is, is the deeper realization that 
market economics have absolutely ruined so many ways of how we engage with each other as human beings. And open source is one of these last weird, uh, if you were to explain every, anyone in the 80s about this on a general level, you'd be like, yeah, and like in 2019, almost everyone would be building commercial applications based on software that people just gave away for free. You'd go like, yeah, that sounds totally crazy. And I, I love that crazy, so to speak. I love the fact that we have this oasis where we're doing things not just for commercial value. Yeah. You don't mind if I steal the arming the rebels uh, idea, do you? It isn't mine, so please spread it on. I try to just uh, uh, let the pollen kind of flow as far as it can in that regard. I think arming the rebels is a, is a wonderful framework of how to think about the world and your place in it. Yeah, I, I love the metaphor. So, all right, anything else we should tackle here, guys, before we uh, head into picks? Sure, I got one thing. I admittedly have been sitting here struggling with imposter syndrome, trying to figure out what question could I possibly ask DHH. But my question is, like, as we continue arming these rebels, and as we saw from RailsConf this year, when they asked how many people is this your first RailsConf, more than half the room, it seems, shot up their hand. What is one thing that you would say or piece of advice you would give to a, a new Rails program or a new program in general in terms of you know not making a certain mistake or keeping true to a certain philosophy? Avoid JS frameworks and microservices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's hard to boil it down to one thing because having been in technology for this long, I, I've accumulated a whole backpack of opinions on, on most things. So we could do another hour on that. But I think actually the way you frame the answer to your question is a good place to start, the imposter syndrome. Embrace the conceptual compression that we've done in Rails. Don't think you need to understand everything from day one. Don't feel like unless you understand all the intricacies of uh, inner or outer joints and SQL or whatever Flexbox designs and CSS, there's so many things to learn when you build web applications that it's so easy to get overwhelmed. Just start. Build something. One thing, one screen. Learn what you need to learn just in time as you move on. That's how I learned Ruby. That's how I built Rails. That's how we built Basecamp. I think it's just it's so important not to be discouraged. And that's one of the why I wanted to make the argument that I think Rails stay, Rails 6, even though it's a much larger framework than it used to be, is easier to learn. But it requires the discipline that you don't think like you need to understand every Rails API on day one or day two, or year three. And in fact, that uh, even people who work with Rails every day, as I do, we don't understand it all. Just make it a little better every day. Every day you find something where you go, huh, I wonder how that works. Take 10 minutes, bundle, gem bundle, open, act, uh, action text. Understand like, hey, actually, how do the file uploads work? Let me just try to look into it. And if you don't understand it that day, you, you, you open up, that's okay. We're not all going to understand everything right away. Try again tomorrow. Like every day, you just you learn a little bit and it gets a little bit better. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. I mean, I like what you said earlier about embracing the magic of Rails. And I find that some people use that as like a negative in Rails. But I, when I started learning Rails and started learning to program, I found that to be the best part because I could get a blog up and running in 15 minutes. I didn't have to learn how all the SQL joins worked and things like that. You know, I could continue to learn those and take those in as I continue to move forward. And as I needed to reach for certain tools, I could, but I didn't have to know them all on day one. Absolutely. I mean, the, to me, the essence of embracing magic is the key to stop being such a bunch of gatekeeping assholes, which is what the tech industry is in many corners. A lot of the times. That is just a bunch of people yelling at you, read the fucking manual, or why don't you understand this? Or like, these are not professionals, or all these things that people who are new to the industry constantly get thrown in their face. And it's just so fucking disillusioning to hear that. So Rails tries to stay strong on the other side and say like, here's fucking magic. We will allow you to do magical, wonderful things with technology that you don't fully understand. And that's okay. Yeah, but 10x engineers don't like the magic. I love, I, I love that Twitter stream, man. It was priceless. Yeah, I think it's that's another one-hour segment because I have such conflict yeah. emotions around 10x. I, I actually do believe that there's something to that concept, but it's such a secondary concern from do you have a 10x environment? Do you have a 10x yes. approach? The sort of the sheer productivity and value of 
making something work for everyone. I think Rails in itself is a, is a great example of that, right? We have, what, 3,000 people, or maybe it's more than that. Actually, I should probably look up how many that is. Thousands and thousands of people who've 5,390 people have contributed code changes to Rails in the time we've been counting. That is worth so much more than a handful of 10x programmers, right? The yep. true magic and the true progress we've had for the long haul has been engaging everyone and everyone has something to share and everyone can make things better. Yep. All right. Well, I'm, we're getting toward the end of the time we scheduled with you and I don't want to keep you over. If people want to follow your thoughts on things or see what you're working on, where do they find you? You know what? I used to just spout off my Twitter account as, as with no thoughts about it. These days I have even more conflicted feelings about Twitter than I have had. And I've had <laughs> conflicted feelings for a very long time, but it probably still is at DHH on Twitter. I don't think it's, I want to caveat that with all sorts of things. Twitter is not a healthy place. That doesn't mean it's a useless place or it isn't an appealing place or that you can't learn things. It just means it's not a healthy place. Even for me, right. even my feed at time, if you just follow my feed, you're going to get an unhealthy feed. You have to mix it up, actually dilute it with some fucking puppies or actual cute unicorns or something else. Because if you just otherwise listen to people like me who point out all the shitty things about technology every day, you're going to end up depressed. So please dilute if you do uh, choose to follow me on Twitter because my feed is 90% the world is fucked up and 10% here's some cool new stuff. Perhaps a slightly more welcoming place that isn't as um, negative is uh, I write on our company blog called signalbnoise.com. I've been writing there for almost 20 years. It has a very long back catalog and I try to summarize sort of the major ideas in more appealing and less depressing ways than they just flow out of Twitter. And then finally, we have a podcast at Basecamp called Rework. It's at rework.fm. And we've been starting to actually turn that podcast into even more of a builder's podcast, a technical podcast to some extent. We have a new uh, description of our methodology that we use to build software at Basecamp that's called Shape Up. And we've been um, discussing that a bunch on the rework.fm podcast and we have a whole series plan where we'll discuss how we build software at Basecamp, how we deal with bugs, how we deal with with all the banal aspects of how it is to build software every day for 20 years and uh, perhaps also the mo- more exciting parts of that and, and I think uh, most listeners on, on this show would probably enjoy those kinds of uh, debates. Nice. One of the things that I have as a goal for devchat.tv is to cover technologies that are up and coming, things that we're probably going to have to deal with on a more regular basis in the future. Some of these include AI, VR, and one of them is blockchain. So I reached out to one of the experts that I knew, Gregory McCubbin, and we pulled together a few other people and we've started a podcast called Adventures in Blockchain. So if you're looking at blockchain as something that you may want to work in, something that you're curious about learning more about, or something that you just want to keep current on until you have the opportunity to make a career jump and go over and work in blockchain and crypto, then definitely check out Adventures in Blockchain. You can find it at adventuresinblockchain.io. All right, folks. Well, let's do some picks. Dave, Kimura, do you want to do some picks for us? Yeah, sure. So my first pick is going to be the swing set kit that I bought off Amazon, which I know you hate Amazon, David, or dislike it, but it was a great deal for our family. And I was able to go to the local Home Depot to buy all the wood to construct a swing set. My kid's been loving it. And my second pick is... Rail 6. I love it. I've been using it for about four months now or three months. And I've had nothing but great things to say about it. And my third pick is going to be Ruby, but not the language Ruby, my daughter Ruby. Say hello. Hello. Because she is just the sweetest little thing. And she loves just sitting in her daddy's lab while he's on the talk show. Nice. Andrew, what are your picks? So I've been trying to work a bit on my communication skills because I know I have, it's hard for me to truly communicate sometimes some of the words in my head because they're a bit of a jumbled mess occasionally. So I picked up a book at a bookstore recently called How to Say It, and I've been really enjoying it and kind of would just suggest to everyone that if you kind of struggle with communication or you think you can improve on it, there's definitely resources out there. I will also say that I really do like rework. I listened to it a lot. Recently, I shared the episode where David shared a little bit about the Ruby on Rails framework. And I sent that episode to some people 
at work. And they found it really interesting because they were not in a technical background and just kind of learning more about what the software developers at my company do and what they use was pretty interesting to them, they said. Nice. Nate, what are your picks? Well, I have to start. Uh, I'd be a little remiss if I didn't uh, thank David for giving us Ruby on Rails. I know I pushed pushed on him a little bit in the interview, but I really do subscribe to the Rails philosophy, and I'm, and I'm very grateful that you decided to share it with the world. The other pick that I've got is a bit self-serving, but I've got David's ear, and I just wanted to call it to his attention. It's a Ruby gem that I've recently built and been working on. It's a way to build reactive applications with all of the wonderful things that come inside of uh, Ruby on Rails as a framework. So it embraces the HTML-centric worldview. It embraces stimulus and action cable and all of those things. And that library is called Stimulus Reflex. Nice. I'm sure David is furiously typing to check it out. <laughs> I'm sure he is. I am, actually. <laughs> I didn't know that. I thank you for looking it up. So I'm going to jump in here with a couple of picks. It was funny because on Tuesday, I was at a book launch party. It was for Pat Flynn, if you know who he is. He's got a podcast called Smart Passive Income. And anyway, he was talking about his new book, Superfans, and he quoted DHH. And I'm just sitting there. I leaned over to the guy next to me and I said, yeah, we're talking to DHH on our podcast because it's a podcast conference. So everybody has a podcast. But we're talking to DHH on the podcast on Friday. And I kind of got this look back like, okay, and who is he? Because, you know, outside of Rails or, you know, some business communities, people just don't know. But it's just funny the, the influence that Basecamp has out there where people are paying attention to what's being said and, and things like that. I am going to pick Pat's book. I have a copy of it. I haven't read it yet. But it's basically about building super fans for your, you know, what you're doing and what you're putting out there. And yeah, since I'm all about the content these days, I'm really looking forward to it. While I'm at it, I'm going to pick another book. Uh, I might have picked this one on the show before because I've been reading it for the last week or two. It's called Atomic Habits by James Clear. And uh, yeah, he basically just talks through, you know, why we build habits, how we build habits, uh, how to build good habits. And uh, it's been really, really solid. So um, yeah, really, really digging that. And then my last pick is I've been listening to the these podcasts for a while. There are two of them. One is the Ed Milet show. And the other one is the MF CEO with Andy Frisella. And I know I've mentioned both of these shows on, on this podcast before, but I've been getting a ton out of listening to those guys. They actually have a membership set up where they do coaching calls like twice a month. And they talk about things like leadership and, you know, building a business and things like that. And everything that I get from them is just, it's, it's spot on and solid stuff. And Andy has a tendency to curse a bit on his show if that bothers you, you know, to the point where you wouldn't listen, then don't. But I mean, the stuff there, if you're trying to build a business, if you're trying to get ahead, if you're trying to figure out, you know, how do I take personal responsibility for my life? These shows are awesome. So I'm going to pick both of those as well. David, do you have some things you want to shout out about? Sure. I've been on an Eric from trip for the past uh, year plus or so and reading uh, as many of uh, books as, as I could that he's released. He's a psychotherapist from mid-century. And I would recommend starting with a book called To Have or To Be, which is a wonderful book about questioning the market economics and market worldview that we live in today and getting back to what actually matters in life and it's been hugely influential for me and my understanding of the world not just this book but all of eric Crumb's um, books that i've been reading i think he's an incredibly prolific writer but to have it to be great place to start that i think anyone could benefit from particularly if you like some of the thoughts that i had in this year's railsconf keynote there's a lot more where that come from where that came from in, in these kinds of books um, I'd also call out self-servingly our own book on software methodology called Shape Up. I got started in the software development industry just around the time that Agile broke onto the scene. And then it was awesome to see Agile question everything and reset expectations. And Agile has clearly conquered much of how we think about uh, software development. But I also think it's time to challenge a lot of those concepts, particularly the concepts as they are embodied in specific methodologies like Scrum. 
like the guilt associated with an endless backlog, uh, the wisdom of daily standups or two week cycles. We take a very different approach at Basecamp, even if it stems from some of the same values that you would find in something like the Agile Manifesto. But uh, Basecamp.com slash shape up in one word is uh, the book about how we build software at Basecamp. It's completely free. It's online. You can link to all the chapters and uh, uh, we continue to refine it and, and make it better. So I pitched that. And then um, let's see. What else? I think that's, uh, that's probably good. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming and talking to us, David. Oh, shit. Sorry. Rail 6, of course. We just released it just now. <laughs> I just reached the announcement while listening to the fix. So Rail 6, get on it. Yeah, for the listener, um, right before we got on the call, David told us that we were like 15 minutes or so away from the final release of Rail 6. So, yeah, it, it got released while we recorded this, which is kind of a, a fun detail. All right, folks, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Thanks again, David. And we will catch everyone next week with another show. Thanks for having me. Bye bye. 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 Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C A C H E F L Y dot com to learn more. <laughs>